if a company, no matter where they are in the world, says, no, we know that we have to do better than we do today, then the question becomes, all right, there are lots of different ways of building products, thousands of ways of building products. What's the way that the best companies most consistently use? Hi, Pavel Horin here. In this interview, Akash Gupta and I interview Marty Kagan, a legendary product leader, founder of Silicon Valley Product Group and author of Inspired and Empowered. In his new book, Transformed, Marty explains how to transition to the product operating model, the model in which the best product organizations work. We hope you will enjoy the interview as much as we did. Let's get into it right now. All right. This is super exciting, everybody, here with Pavel and Marty Kagan. Um, we were just discussing off air that uh, when I started product management in 2008, I purchased the first edition of Inspired. And I actually have now two copies of Inspired because this is the second edition. So um, Marty has played a very formative role in my product career. And I'm curious, uh, Pavel, I'm sure, has a very similar story. <laughs> That's the first edition, Marty. Yeah. Yeah, I have a very similar story because after reading really Inspired, I got interested in product management uh, seriously and I started <laughs> reading more and uh, writing the content. So this was transformative for me. Yeah, I think every product manager probably has a similar tale. So thank you for what you've done for the product career. Oh, uh, well. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I started. Um, I mean, I started product a long time ago, literally in the 1980s, so it's a long time ago, but there wasn't really any books. I mean, good or bad, there wasn't really any books. There were some books from the old, what we call product marketing, but there wasn't on product management. And I remember the person who was coaching me saying, you know, there's no books on this. It's The tech industry is not that big. There aren't that many of us that do this. The main way you learn it is from other people that have <laughs> done it, learned it before. And so I, um, and I realized, of course, after I left the bubble of Silicon Valley and kind of went to more companies around the industry and around the world, that there was so few resources for people who wanted to learn product. Um, and of course, today is very different. Today, there are so many resources, but today we kind of have a different problem. Um, because there are many different views on on how to do product, and so um, it's hard to uh, it's hard to get heard above the noise. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many different viewpoints, and actually, that was probably our first question: is given how many yeah. different um, perspectives people are hearing. Why do they need to check out your latest book? Like, why this new book? Why do you think it's needed as another perspective out there in terms of how to build product? Well, just to be clear, this new book, it's called Transform to Move into the Product Operating Model. Um, this book is different than the other books. The other books, well, as you know, Inspired is all about product managers and product teams and how they create products. It's really a book on product discovery. Um, and then, uh, the, in fact, when that book you know, came out a couple editions uh, and the most common request we would get at the time was, you know, the managers don't understand, the leaders don't understand. So can you share the same kinds of principles and practices for the leaders? And that was the motivation for Empowered. But even once uh, Empowered was out, the single most common question we would get, and this is a question from all over the world, uh, even some teams in San Francisco, they would say, okay, what you've described in Inspired and Empowered is how we know we need to work. They would say that. But then they would say, but our company is so far away from this. It is like night and day different. And this is the big shocker to me is literally you can be in downtown San Francisco and two companies are across the street from each other. And one is doing products like, you know, Amazon and the other one is doing products like a bank. And they're literally right across the street. I think that's like crazy. And of course, the further you get around the world, 
you see this distribution, this difference between how the best companies work and the rest. So Transform was written to try to answer the question, how in the world do we move from working like a bank <laughs> to working like a good product company? And so it's different. It's not about like, here's how you do good product. It's about how do you change your organization to be able to do good product, which of course is the transformation question. But the big thing underlying your question though is, is why should a company change? Even, you know, do they want to change? One of the things I don't try to fight is some companies don't want to change. They, they, especially, you know, I'm teasing banks, but banks make so much money. Most of them don't want to change. The same is true with telcos. They make so much money. Now, both banks and telcos are often in protected industries. So they can, you know, who am I to say, you know, you really should change. I do believe they should change because they can better take care of their customers. But if their CEO doesn't want to change, mostly because they're making so much money, <laughs> then Okay, do what they want to do. But for companies that do believe they need to they need to get good at product. And to me that's uh most of the world. And by the way, even banks now, thanks to our friends at Stripe. Stripe is finally scaring banks. So that's why I love Stripe so much. They are not only doing a good job for their customers, but I think they're doing a good job for the world's customers. So anyway, if a company, no matter where they are in the world, says, no, we know that we have to do better than we do today, then the question becomes, all right, there are lots of different ways of building products, thousands of ways of building products. What's the way that the best companies most consistently use? And that's really why... Um, that's why I started doing what I do is to share what I see in the best companies. You know, I point this out with every book. It's in the new book as well, that nothing in the book was invented by us. Nothing. All, all we do is we share what we see working well in the best companies. And uh, we'll, sh we'll try to explain to companies why we think that's a good thing to do <laughs> and how you would try it out. Now, it is true that after doing this for uh, I've now done it for 20 years, sharing these practices. So after 20 years, you see a lot of patterns. And you start to see what's really common. Because if you talk to any company, like if you talk to Apple, they'll say Apple is special and this is why they do their magic way. If you talk to Amazon, they say the same thing. Spotify, same thing. It's not true with any of them. If you look at really how all of those good companies work, there is much more in common than different. In fact, mostly what they do different is more a function of the personalities of their founders. And so if you peel away that, yeah, I mean, at Amazon, they call it working backwards. For us, we call it, you know, starting with the vision. It's the same concept and it's a critical concept. And you find that in different companies with different names. But I feel like what what we can do, and I'm really speaking for myself and just Silicon Valley Product Group, we're only five people, we're just a small little group, is we can we do get to work with a lot of these good companies so we can share what we think is important. So, uh, in fact, we shared an article recently called The Product Model at Spotify because, as you know, most people thought they knew the Spotify model and it was a bunch of nonsense. Uh, they were just, you know, no idea what they were they were hearing a bunch of agile coaches interpretations of what Spotify mm -hmm. was doing. But of course, an experienced product person looks at Spotify and says, that's none of that is relevant. That's just their Swedish words for what we good companies know they need to do. And in fact, Spotify, I would argue, is an excellent example of a strong product company. And that's the single biggest reason they still exist, even though they're competing against the best companies in the world <laughs> at product. They still are holding their own. They're doing wonderful. I mean, there's no, they have no right to even still be running as a company with their competing against Apple and Amazon and Google, but they do. And the same is true. You know, I'm actually in the middle of writing an article right now about the product model at Amazon. 
Amazon is probably the most consistently innovative company in the world and has probably had the biggest impact on this idea of a product model. But that's what I was getting at is that you start to see patterns. Mm -hmm. And we, we realized we needed a name for those patterns. <laughs> because for many years, if you look at my writing, I would just say, well, there's how the best work and how the rest work. <laughs> that which is not very precise, right? Just say work like the best. So we for this new book, we said we if you're going to help a company transform, you need to talk about where you're going to transform to. What does that really mean? You can't just say like the best. You have to define that. And that's where we uh, adopted the term product operating model from some of the companies that uh, we work with. And we thought that was good because it's a model. It's not a process. It's just a conceptual model. And it's what that really means is there's a set of principles and if the company does those principles well, they seem to do well consistently in product. So that's really what the book is about. It really shares those principles, and then it shares examples of companies that transformed, how they transformed and why they transformed, and what they were able to do after they transformed. Would it be possible, Marta, to just briefly describe those principles, those patterns that you discovered in, in the best companies? Uh, yeah, this is a short interview, so uh, of course we cannot go in deep and into the, uh, everything that we can uh, find in the book, but maybe some key dimensions, key elements. Yeah, absolutely. Well, stop me if I get too detailed. <laughs> you could feel free to stop me at any time. But we kind of define this starting at the highest level, starting at the highest level, the very highest level. It's really about all about moving from output to outcomes. So if you had to say in one phrase what it's about, it's about changing to delivering outcomes, which as everybody knows who has even ever tried, that is very hard. Uh, outcomes is hard. Output is easy. <laughs> so at the highest level, it's about outcomes. But what does that really mean? Because that's, that's just a, a phrase. That doesn't really mean much. So if you double click on that, there are three dimensions that we see in every good product company. And it, it talks about when you transform three dimensions. The first dimension is changing how you decide what problems you need to solve. In other words, making your decisions on strategy. What is most important work to do? The way the best companies do that is very different than how most companies do with their big annual roadmaps and planning meetings and stuff like that. So the first topic is changing how you decide which problems are important to solve. That's really product strategy. The second dimension is changing how you solve those problems. In other words, the old, you know, one way, which is what's used still in most of the world, is the stakeholders define a bunch of features and projects that they prioritize onto roadmaps, and the team just knocks them out one after another. That's a feature team. And in good companies, they don't work that way. Those teams are given good problems to solve, and then they're empowered to come up with a solution that delivers the outcome that you need. So, And that's product discovery. So the second big dimension is product discovery, really changing how you solve problems. And the third big dimension, and I would argue all three of these are interrelated, but the third big dimension is changing how you build, test, and deploy your products. And this is, um, uh, if you want to prove outcomes, you need to make sure you have the data, which means you have to have everything instrumented. You have to have everything monitored. It means, if you, especially if you want to take care of your customers and not hurt your customers, then, uh, which sounds obvious, but, this is the difference between being agile and doing agile, right? So if you're being agile, you are actually releasing continuously. Now, as you both know, you don't have to be following any agile method to do that. All you have to do is truly be agile. You have to, con you know, small, frequent, uncoupled releases for by each team. So that often means... Uh, changing how you build. Um, that 20 years ago, that's why companies moved to Agile. Today, of course, you probably know a lot of the Agile movement has been sort of taken over by 
what I would call fake agile or agile theater. And so if, if the first thing they tell me is they release every quarter, I'm like, don't bother me. You're not agile in any sense at all. So if you want to take care of your customers, you're going to have to change. I've been struggling with this a lot because I started my journey with Scrum and uh, later I discovered that Scrum doesn't mention how you uh, select what to build. So there is no discovery. Yeah, that, that it's, it's, people try to think, you know, they think of it as a much different thing. They don't really know how to think of it, but it's really just a delivery process and it's fine. There's nothing wrong with, if they do real Scrum, you know, releasing, say, at, at least once every two weeks, I'm usually... Okay, that's okay. That's not anything to brag about. <laughs> that's right. not very impressive. Today, the best practice is continuous deployment. So it's not there, obviously, but it's a whole lot better than releasing once a quarter or even once a month. So, okay, you can be okay that way. All right, so back to Pavel's question. These are the three dimensions, changing how you decide which problems to solve, changing how you solve those problems, and changing how you deploy your solutions. That's, uh, at, again, at a high level. In order to do those things consistently, we argue there are four new competencies that you need in your organization, and there are five new product concepts you need in your organization. And these are tricky because you probably already use these words, but they don't mean the same thing. So, for example, this is where if I get too detailed, and I haven't even reached the level of the principles yet, Pavel. There are 20 principles that we outline in the book, but I will get to your, your direct answer in a minute. But in terms of the competencies, the first one is real product management. You, you know, and most companies don't have that. They have product owners or they have feature team project manager types. They don't have real product managers. But if you're going to have empowered product teams that are responsible for achieving outcomes, I can promise you your very few designers can cover that outcome responsibility. Very few engineers can cover that. They cover other responsibilities that are critical, but that leaves a big hole if you don't have it filled on the team for somebody that can take responsibility for the value and the viability of the solution. So you need real product managers. You also need real designers, product designers, not just graphic designers, real product designers. And of course, you need real engineering tech leads. These are engineers that care just as much about what you build as how you build. And then the hardest of all for most companies is that they need real product leaders. And most of them don't have that. They have managers that manage, you know, people with these titles, but they don't have people that have ever done this job in a product model company. So they have a big hole in product leadership. And product leadership is really two things. They're the ones responsible for coaching and developing the people. And they're the ones responsible for providing the strategic context, which is how teams make good decisions. So the product vision, the product strategy, the team topology, the objectives for each team. In other words, what is the work the team needs to do? Which problems do they need to solve? That comes from the strategic context. So the product leaders have a, a very big role to play. So those are the four new product competencies. And, and I will tell you, this is where most transformation efforts fall down is because the company thinks they have these people, but they don't. So oh, can those companies transform at all? <laughs> if, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's what, <laughs> uh, I, absolutely they can. But mm -hmm. that does mean they have to introduce these competencies. And yes, that's hard. I mean, that is hard. But I, one of the things I knew we had to do in this book was to provide many examples of companies that have successfully transformed. And it was also clear that none of those examples should be Silicon Valley companies. Because the Silicon Valley companies have the advantage of being born in this model. They started in this model. It's much harder to be a company, say, based in London or based in anywhere that has never worked this way before to change. And so all the examples uh, in the book, there are 11, if I remember right, 11 case studies. They all were from companies all, all everywhere else in the world 
uh, including places like Brazil, Saudi Arabia, uh, and of course, uh, England and several other places. Okay, so those are the four competencies. I warned you to stop me if this gets too much. Uh, there are five critical concepts that make up the product model, uh, starting with uh, some of the ones we've talked about already. You need this concept of product strategy. It is a thing that is uh, that spans the product teams. It's another common misconception. They think product teams are supposed to have their own product strategies and product visions, but they just have never worked in a product company, I think, the people that say that. Okay, so uh, product strategy is critical. The concept of a product team across, you know, what Spotify calls a squad, but a cross-functional, truly cross-functional empowered product team that is uh, has the skills in order to come up with effective solutions that are valuable, usable, feasible, viable. That's why teams are really the center of all this. And then, of course, what do the teams do? They do product discovery and product delivery. So they need those concepts as well. And the final concept really underlies all of these, which we refer to as product culture, which are things that span all of them. And they're things like, um, what is the role of experimentation? What is the role of innovation? What is the role of predictability? These are critical cultural aspects. Okay. So those are the five product concepts. And then underlying all this is a set of, by our enumeration, 20 product principles. And that's what Pavel started with. But but in order to get to those principles, I kind of needed to work my way down that stack. But the principles are, like Pavel was asking for some examples of principles. Well, one is, for example, that you're going to tackle all the risks up front. If you don't tackle all the risks up front, you're going to spend all this time and money building the stuff that doesn't work. So you have to make sure you tackle those risks. Another one is that you have to embrace the concept of experiments. If you don't run experiments, you're never going to be able to do the things you need to do. You'll be a very risk-averse company. Those are examples. Another one is what I was referring to before with deployment. If you don't have that principle of small frequent, reliable, uncoupled releases, you won't be able to get these things live, measure the results, iterate like you need to. You also won't be able to prove outcome like you need to. So those are just a handful, but there are quite a few principles. And it's the principles, I think, that are most important because there is, as everybody knows, there's a lot of different cultures out there. There's a lot of different kinds of products. If you're building an iPhone, it's a different thing than if you're building, say, you know, Amazon Prime. It's a very different kind of product. One's a loyalty product, one's a device. But those principles you'll find in each of those, at all of those, I should say. And that's why I think the principles are the most important. And I've always been much more interested in the principles than any process or any framework or any tool that might sometimes help you get there. Sorry for that very long answer to that question. I want to double click on right before we got to the principles. I think you emphasized like the five key requirements and all of those were related to the team. So I actually want to double click on some of the frictions I've encountered in teams that I've led or teams I've been a part of and curious how you try to uh, tackle those. So I think the most common frictions I see are with PMs and engineering managers or tech leads and PMs and designers. So with the designers, I think that one of the things that was crazy was, you know, when Brian Chesky said he eliminated, of course, we all know he didn't eliminate the product management function, designers were so happy. <laughs> and I find this universally is that designers carry a little bit of resentment almost towards their product manager kind of taking some decisions. So I'm curious about that component. And then with the engineering manager, it's a little bit different. It's where they're often tasked with the how to build something. Sometimes they're often tasked with the when, like give me this estimate of when we can also deliver it. And then they're wondering like, how do I have more of a say in the why or what? And so I'm curious for both of those tensions, how um, teams can work to overcome them. Well, the most important thing to realize is that, by the way, I see those tensions all the time. 
but not in real product teams. I see them in feature teams. In fact, they are clear symptoms of feature teams. Now, why? It's worth really double-clicking on that. Why is that? Because in a feature team, the product manager is not doing what I've described before. They, what, what does that mean to even do that? They're already handed a roadmap of output they have to deliver. So in a feature team, you have this person with a title, product manager, product owner, whatever they're called, yet they're not doing the job we talked about. What they're really doing, and I believe they're dramatically overpaid for this, but they're, what they're really doing is project management. And that's why you see in these companies that people bend over backwards in order to try to defend the job. They're saying like, well, our job is to explain the why, or our job is to herd the cats, or our job is to communicate. And like the designers are listening to this and go, seriously, that's your job? I could do that job with a little bit more of what I already do. Or the engineers are looking at it and saying, I could do that job with a little more than what I already do. You're not adding value. They're not. That's the truth. They're not really adding value. They're certainly not adding enough value to justify their existence if the company is in trouble. And as you know, a lot of companies today are in trouble and they are worried about costs. And that is a tough job to defend. And I keep trying to warn people, like, if that's your job, if you're on a feature team, you are vulnerable. A lot of roles are vulnerable, but that one is got a huge target on its back. And so, but you have to realize that that's just a symptom of lack of role clarity. Because really, what is it that they're doing? I always tell anybody that tells me, oh, the job is the why. I'm like, that's 10 minutes a week. 10 minutes a week. What are you doing the rest of the time? How hard is it to re-articulate the why? It comes from the product strategy anyway. So what are you, you're just really reiterating that to the team and that's your job? Or, you know, herding the cats? Okay, well, the truth is we've got a lot of project managers that are already in the engineering organization. They're probably doing most of that anyway. So it's, uh, you're, you're seeing a symptom of being in a different kind of team from what I'm talking about. And I, I see those symptoms all the time. It's a very strong clue about how they're really working. But if you talk to a product team, a real product team at a good product company, the designers are not saying, oh, well, the job is a noise job. The designers are like, I'm glad we have this person because I, don't, I wouldn't want to be doing that job. That is a hard job. Because fundamentally, the product manager, they're responsible for the value and the viability, and that's they take ownership of the outcome. The designer is responsible, of course, for the usability. That's obvious. But they also more generally take responsibility for the customer experience, which is a huge responsibility. And the engineers, of course, are responsible for the technical feasibility. But more generally, they take responsibility for the delivery of the product. So... We've got a very busy team. The designers have no time to play product manager, and the product manager has no time to play designer. And so uh, you've, you don't see that muddied role that you see in feature teams. But I tell companies, you know, if you're going to do the feature team model, you really don't need the product manager. You need good designers and you need good engineers. And I would rather trade that product manager head for another designer. And if you are that product manager that's kind of in that position, or even product leader, I would say even when I was a VP of product management and I was in some of these types of positions, can you realistically drive the transformation? Or is it really like try to incept your leaders to buy a more into this type of thinking more like how do we approach it as middle of the organization product folks who might be in yeah. that situation i think that's one of my favorite questions and topics uh now but the answer is going to be different on whether you're an individual contributor or a leader because you described you know both scenarios there um as uh as a 
as a leader, you actually have a lot of ability to influence change here. As an individual contributor, the main thing I'd say is you have a lot more ability than you probably realize. Uh, one of the things I've been talking about a lot lately is uh, agency, sense of agency. Not enough people realize how much they can impact how their companies work. Because, you know, nothing's worse. And I feel so sorry for those people that feel like a victim. They feel like, you know, they can't do anything because their company sucks and their leaders suck and they can't, they just can't do anything. But really, there's a lot they can do. And I like them to take more ownership of what they can do. At a minimum, I promise it will help their career. At a minimum. In a maximum, it might actually change the course of their company. So there's a lot there are factors outside of their control. But let's let's so let's answer that first for the individual contributor. So one of the most common questions I get is uh a uh, product manager will say, okay, now I, I totally understand my situation. I'm a feature team product manager, and that's why I'm so unhappy. And so their question usually is, do I have to change companies if I want to have a real job, you know, be a real product yeah. manager? And I, I, you know, I tell them honestly, sometimes, but not usually. Usually um, you can significantly improve your role at your company but it does take you taking some initiative to raise your skills. So, for example, the classic, especially in Europe, is to go from a product owner, which, as you probably know, has had almost no training in product, but they do know one or more delivery processes like Scrum or Kanban. So they're, they're raising their skills from a role on a process to a real job. Now, that means they they do some work like you both have done, like I did, which is we go learn what a product manager really is. <laughs> and what does that mean? We have to go talk to a lot of customers. I remember the person who was coaching me wouldn't, as a new product manager, would not let me make a single decision until I visited in person 30 customers, 15 in the US, 15 in Europe. And and it was the best thing I ever did. And uh, and that, that was not the end of my customer visits. That was my start of my customer visits. But when you, you can't do the job of product manager if you don't deeply engage with your users and customers. Another big thing that I didn't, I just, I was an engineer that moved into products. So I had some skills, but not many. Um, so for example, I knew nothing about the go to market. I knew nothing about the marketing, the sales, the service, how our products actually made it into the hands of customers. I knew nothing about the financial analytics, the cost structure or the monetization and all that I had to learn. I was able to learn that in all, all of it in less than three months. Most people can't. But it does take a willingness. And I remember the person who was coaching me, the first question he asked me was, are you willing to put in the effort to do what I tell you you need to do? Because if I had said no, he was going to say, well, I'm not interested. Because he wasn't getting any extra money to coach me. It was just part of his, he was doing it as a good citizen, as a leader in the company. And, um, and I said, absolutely. I wanted to, genuinely wanted to learn this. I'm like, you tell me what I need to learn. I will I will do everything I can to learn it. It doesn't take that long. That's the ironic part. It really doesn't if you're sort of pointed in the right direction. Now, I was super lucky to have somebody who was amazing at product coach me on this. But today, there's a lot more. Now, this is separate from the issue of the noise we were talking about before, because unfortunately, the vast majority of resources I see out there and you know I'm not including you two in this. That's why we're doing this call. But the vast majority of the resources are just trying to help people become a better feature team product manager, which is not useful. So what I want to help them do is become a real product manager. Defining real is how the best companies actually do this. And that means they have to do some work. They have to learn the customers. They have to learn the data. They have to learn the business dimensions. They have to learn the industry. But you can all do that. 
And what I tell individuals is once you've done that, at a minimum, your comp- your leaders, your manager will recognize that all of a sudden you know a lot more than you did before. And by the way, what the things you know are incredibly helpful. I've seen people get promoted just from that. <laughs> And then, of course, now they're in a product leader position where they can now influence more than just this. But to your original question, what can an individual do? They can raise their skills. The next thing they can do is try to win the hearts and minds of their own team. So that means going to your designer, going to your engineers, and helping them uh, see the advantage of working this way. Now, most designers and engineers, in my experience, are not the problem. They were trained to work this way. They're, they're frustrated they haven't been able to. But one way or another, you need to get, get on the same page with your team. So as an individual, you can do yourself and you can do your team. And then you can start showing your company what you're capable of. Now, you have to do that in a responsible way so you don't just ignore the roadmap. It's just that you start doing a lot better job delivering what's on that roadmap. So um, once you, that's, that's what I recommend for the individual. The product leader, of course, has a much bigger span of impact there. They now can raise the skills of their, the, their first responsibility, if you're a product leader, is to raise the skills of your product managers. In fact, I tell product leaders that they will be judged by their weakest product managers. So they need to take that personally, and that needs to be their job, their responsibility. Now, the biggest issue that most of them have is they don't, they never work this way. So they don't really, they, they know they need to get good at this, but they don't know how. That is literally why I wrote the book Empowered, was to share the biggest section in Empowered is on coaching. And it tries to share this. So I I usually encourage those people just take one chapter a week, do one-on-ones with your people, raise their skills, and you're raising your own skills at the same time. The other thing that can help is an experienced product leadership coach. You may know that over the last couple of years, uh, my partners and uh, and I have been uh, reaching out to meet a lot more product coaches out there because we get asked to introduce and refer product coaches almost every day. And we had a few that we've known for a long time. Teresa Torres is wonderful. Jeff Patton is wonderful. We've been recommending them for many, many years, but we overwhelmed them a long time ago. And so we needed a bigger network. Today we have a network of about 50 product coaches around the world that we think are good. We don't have any money relationship with any of them. We don't want many money relationship. We just want to know which ones are good. When I say good, I'm talking about the people that I know have been there, done that, at a good product company and can genuinely help another company get there. And today there are good coaches in most parts of the world. I'm hoping to see that really grow and be more uh, more like that. Um, because if you're a product leader that's got this responsibility, but you've never done it before, then a product leadership coach is probably your best bet for quickly coming up to speed. Does that make sense? I love the point about uh, taking the initiative as an individual, because the, at the end of the day, I think this is what leadership is about, that you don't necessarily need to influence other with having formal authority and if you can do that just by um, acquiring new skills and uh, winning the minds and hearts of, of people around, that's even better. So, yes, yeah, perfect. <laughs> I like the concept you kind of talked about, which is basically like your inside world and your outside world. And like as the VP of product, I think you can be a little bit of a shit umbrella. There's still infinite company-wide planning processes, OKR processes, but you don't necessarily need to subject your company to those waterfall processes. You can actually fill out all those forms for them and you can tell them, hey, you go be empowered. You go do continuous discovery. And so I think just identifying kind of your sphere of influence, the areas where you are able to make decisions and then the areas that you're able to cover them is a really effective way as you move up the ladder. You know, it's, I don't mean to make this sound easier than it is because the product leaders, especially the, 
Within the product organization, in my experience, it's not that hard. I mean, if you do your job, most of the people want to work the way we're talking about. There's some, but most don't. Most are very enthusiastic about this change. The bigger issue is the rest of the company. And, you know, the rest of the company has never worked this way before. They don't really understand. They're, they're worried about losing control. They're worried about losing, you know, what happens if I'm still accountable to the numbers, but I don't have this, inf you know, this same influence I had before. So the real nuance comes to these product leaders to win over the hearts and minds of the rest of the company, especially the key stakeholders and the key executives. And that takes building trust and sort of being very smart about picking your battles. Um, what, you know, you can go in and say, we're not going to do any of this stuff anymore. And if you don't like it, tough luck. That doesn't go over well in most companies, uh, especially if the CEO is also nervous, which most of them are. So what we want to do is work a lot more, you know, gently with those leaders to understand like, look, are you also frustrated that you keep funding all these features and they're not generating the results you want? So am I. How about we do some experiments together to see if we can't do this better for you, literally for you. And they, you know, not many of them are going to, most of them are going to be pretty excited about that possibility because this is a very different framing. In fact, that's why we chose the term product operating model. As you know, most a lot of people like product-led company and product-driven company. But, you know, when you talk about the to these stakeholders, they do not like those terms. And it's not hard to understand why. Yeah, I think that labeling it and being having a the truly um influential product leader. That's kind of the real rarity amongst those five requirements you mentioned that a lot of these companies are struggling with. If that product leader hasn't lived it, then they can't influence it. It's a very tough process for some teams. Well, in fact, I would argue that the real key to successful transformation there's a lot of things that have to go right, a lot of things that are hard, but the real key are those product leaders, especially the head of product and the head of engineering. If those two leaders do what they need to do, the company has a real solid chance at succeeding on this. But if they don't, it's almost impossible. Yeah. Could we maybe go into a specific example or a case study where you worked with um, maybe like a head of product and head of engineering and how did they, how did they approach it? How long did it take them? And how did they, um, did they, I've heard you talk about in previous interviews, like finding like maybe like a set of teams even where they um, piloted in. Is that like the approach you recommend or how do they go about that one to two year strategy of transforming their company? Yeah, and pilot teams are one of our core techniques that everybody, you know, it's a smart idea. Instead of rolling it out to a whole company, you know, it's just like an A-B test, but on the organization instead of on your product, uh, right? You're taking a small group, you're letting them run this. And even if everything goes perfect, and it never does, but if even if everything went perfect, the rest of the company is able to observe and you know how people are. Some people hate change. Some people need time for change. This is uh, a pilot teams really help companies uh, get through that. But to your question, so um, in in uh, one of my favorite examples in the book is uh, the company in based in London called Trainline. Trainline, uh, if you ride the trains, and in fact, a little known fact: Monday through Friday, Trainline's app is higher rated than Uber. That's how popular it is. And Trainline a few years ago was was nothing. It was uh, it sold some tickets, although they didn't even have a mobile app. It was all, well, you'd have to go to a laptop or something and, and buy a, a ticket, but it was nothing in the industry. And uh, one of the big private equity firms decided that that's crazy. That should be an amazing tech-powered company. And so they bought the company. And the first thing they did, this is normal when, when it's a private equity firm, is they brought in a CEO that knew what she was doing. They brought in a woman named Claire Gilmartin. She had come from eBay. And they said, look, you turn this around. 
uh, set it up like you would set up a product company. And uh, the first thing she did was she brought in a head of product and a head of engineering. Now, I realize in that case, they had almost nothing. It was all outsourced. It was all obsolete tech stack. It was very small number of developers. And like I said, most of them weren't even employees. They were remote. It was, um, you know, not what we're talking about. So she brought in the two leaders and the three of them got to work. Now, it normally takes somewhere between one and three years to transform, depending on the size of the organization. This was like a mid mid sized company. It was a real enterprise. It had been around several years, but it was, you know, it was not designed around uh, the principles we're talking about. So these leaders had to introduce those principles. They started by looking at the staff they had and uh, seeing which ones wanted to learn how to work this way. Um, and there was uh, a few engineers that were on staff and wanted to. That was fine. There were, but they had to do a lot of hiring. And then same with product. There were more that Jonathan, the head of product was a guy named Jonathan Moore, who's uh, uh, I've known for many years. He is, um, in fact, he's now a partner at SVPG, uh, Jonathan. But um, Jonathan had led the transformation at The Guardian. Many of you know The Guardian. He, I first met him as a brand new product manager at the BBC, where he was responsible for one of the most famous properties today, uh, BBC News. So um, it's uh, Jonathan and uh, his head of engineering, they got to work putting these things in place. You heard me say that the two big responsibilities of these product leaders are developing their people, hiring, coaching, and then developing the strategic context. In this case, the product vision, the product strategy, the team topology, the architecture, and they got to work. And they, uh, after about three years, they became the UK's biggest IPO to date at, as of that date. Uh, that's why you transform. And by the way, they went from nothing to literally one of the country. Now they're all over Northern Europe too. It's not just UK, but um, to one of the favorite apps. You talk to people in London, ask them for their top three favorite apps. It usually includes Trainline. I have a related question. <laughs> Doesn't matter that you mentioned that uh, the CEO brought the head of product. So... Is it possible to coach a product leader that doesn't have a product experience as an individual contributor? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a fair question because one answer is like like Claire did, just go recruit somebody strong and let them do it again. That's one answer. The other answer is if your company has leaders that they think are good. In fact, another story we told in the book is a company called CarMax, uh, and CarMax is uh, the biggest used car sales company in the U.S. They're based in the other side of the U.S. on the East Coast and not a technology center. And they're a car sales company. They're not. They weren't born a tech company in any way. But they had strong people that they believed could be coached. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, in fact, I was one of those people helping, but they had other people helping as well. Um, and... These are people that had the right mindset and the right sort of motivation. They just didn't have the experience. And that's why I was saying that in many cases, a product leadership coach is very much what you need. By the way, there are also CTO coaches that do the same thing for engineering leaders. They, um, that's what they do. They are you know, somebody who may have been an IT manager, but now wants to become a technology you know, head of engineering. And so those are different skills. And so they learn that. That's the main, those are the two main ways I know. You either bring in people that have the experience or you you have a leadership coach that helps them learn the experience on the job. How have people messed up hiring a coach in your example? Like what what's the anti-pattern? What should they avoid? <laughs> Well, by far, and I am worried about this. I'm always worried about this. The, by far, the biggest problem is that they hire a coach because the person says they're a coach, <laughs> but they don't actually have the experience. 
They've never actually done product uh, at a serious company. The biggest example of this I know, the single biggest example, and I this is very frustrating, is the vast majority of people teaching CSPO and PSPO classes. In other words, teaching product owners have never done product. They are just agile coaches that have been trained in a method like Scrum or worse, and uh, they think they can train these people. <laughs> and what they're really teaching them is like, okay, you have to use Jira to prioritize a backlog. That's not product. That's administration. That's why they're called, you know, these are backlog administrators. So what we need are people who actually know product to teach product, to coach product. And so I, you know, you, there's no way in a, in a relatively free market world, there's no way to, to, for anybody, I think, to stop someone from saying, I'm a product coach. <laughs> uh, to me, the only thing we can do is try to educate the consumers, educate the, the people at a company that is hiring these coaches and try to help them understand what to look for. So I did something unusual in the new book transformed. I was so worried about this. I am so worried about this because if, if what does it mean to be an agile coach today? Almost nothing. If that same thing happens to product coach, we lose. So I was so worried about that. I decided to profile seven real product coaches in the book. And I do this because I want people who want to transform to be able to get a really good idea of what good looks like. And every one of them has serious experience doing product at a good product company, and they care about coaching. One of the problems we have in Europe, there is this whole, uh, there is a big, you know, there's a big movement around coaching, but for, th for that movement, coaching is a different thing. It's uh, it's some, and, and don't get me wrong, it's good, but it's not the kind of coaching that these people need. If if they they talk about you know sort of career coaching, life coaching, that's nice, but that's not what this is about. I have never met a coach like that that could actually help you do a good product strategy. Sorry. They can say all the nice things to you and they can make you feel good, but that doesn't help you do a product strategy. <laughs> so um, there are some softer skills that those people could probably help you with indirectly, but I would much rather have a proven leader that has already worked with these kinds of stakeholders and can help you tangibly to do this. So this is an especially sensitive topic in Europe because there they have a very different definition of coaching. And I don't know what to do about that. You know, in the U.S., we have a very strong institution about coaching, the famous book Trillion Dollar Coach about Bill Campbell, and really what differentiates a coach. And I think this is the part that surprised me about Europe. Europe loves football, as everybody knows, and a football coach is not a touchy-feely person. A football coach is there to help you be an amazing football team help you develop your skills. If you go to a golf coach, you're expecting them to have deep knowledge about the mechanics of golf and could help you with that. They're not just about, you know, helping you have a good attitude or something. So anyway, we need people that know how to do things like coach other product managers that know how to do things like a real product vision and a real product strategy. That is probably the key to successful transformations at scale. I would love to ask one more question. Uh, <laughs> Go for it, I'm fine. About the product operating model. So Martin, you mentioned that um, there are 20 principles, is that okay, correct? Right. In the book. So how should we interpret those principles as best practices, as something that works or works in most cases? Can we break some of those principles depending on the situation or all are required to to have a good product organization? No, it's a good question. It's a hard question. Um, 
I, I, you know, when you look at this, the craft of product over the last 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, I don't know how far back you want to look. In some ways, things have not changed much at all. In other ways, they've changed dramatically. I would argue the things that have not changed much at all are the principles. And I would argue that things that have changed dramatically are the tools and methods of applying those principles dramatically. Product is so much, the tools to do product today are so much better than when I first learned. But interestingly, the principles have barely changed. My belief is that the principles, if they're really true product first principles, then they're probably very durable. And it's worth pointing out, a principle doesn't say how you do it. It just says that you need to do this. You need to find a way. For example, one of those principles I already mentioned was an experimentation culture. Well, as you know, the tools and techniques for doing experiments have gone from very primitive to very advanced. So, but we still do experiments. <laughs> they were harder before, but we still did them. But the point is not how to do those experiments. I have different advice with every company. When I'm working with a device company, it's very different on how to do an experiment than when I'm working with a pure software company. But they still need to do experiments. In fact, the, uh, the counterintuitive thing is a device company has to do more of them because the, the, uh, the downside of messing up mm. with a device is much worse than if we mess up in software. So it, that's where the differences, I think, really are. Now, will new principles emerge? I don't know, probably, mm. but... I don't think it will over the next couple of years. I think those principles emerge very slowly um, if they're really principles, that they're, they're lasting. Mm -hmm. When I look at the principles in the book, it's hard to, um, I mean, I, I'm, I would say they always have existed. They more, principles speak more to the nature of technology powered products and not about the particular frameworks or process or methods. Those change constantly and, um, and to me are much less important. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I can't wait to, <laughs> to read the book and, and understand it in detail. Akash? Agreed, yes. I can't either. I want to be conscious of your time, though. So maybe we'll switch to just the simple, fun questions. I think you did these with Lenny, so we've chose different ones this time, of course. But um, what's the your favorite book that you've read recently? Well, do you mean work-related or not work-related? That reflects a lot about you, which you choose. We're curious to see. <laughs> well, I, I read a lot of work-related books, uh, <laughs> but I love reading. But uh, I would say my favorite work-related book recently is Build by Tony Fidel. I actually have it here because um, I really enjoyed that book. Here it is. Um, so Build is talking. Oh, yeah, yeah. Bob has got it too. <laughs> I hope you liked it too. But it's talking, it's describing the product model. The difference is he worked in hardware companies and I mostly worked in software companies. Uh, and, uh, but he has, you know, he was in the right place at the right time. He got to work on the original iPod. He got to work on the iPhone. He got to work. He started the company Nest and I love device products. I really do. Um, I started my career at a hardware company, so I love those kinds of products, but it was really fun reading his, uh, first person account of this. Uh, and he's, you know, came from a designer engineer to a CEO. So he's got great perspective. I thought that was a very good book. And it was interesting because he, the subtitle of the book is an, an unorthodox guide to making things worth making. But when you read it, the reason it's unorthodox is because it's not about any of the modern processes or anything like that. It's all about the principles. Awesome. Yeah. Um, do you want to do the next one? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Martha, what's your favorite product culture? Favorite product culture? Yeah. 
Oh, that's a hard one. Um, uh, I mean, I, uh, <laughs> I'm kind of a student of product culture. And I see I've got pretty good at spotting the good and the bad at each culture. I'd have to say if I could, um, the closest to my dream culture is probably Netflix. Yeah. Netflix sets the empowerment dial even higher than really any other company. And they set it even higher than I normally even recommend. They sort of set the dial to 12 on a scale of one to 10, you know, so high. <laughs> but I also am so impressed with what they've done over the years. Um, but there are, honestly, there's things I love about Apple's culture, about Google's culture, about Stripe's culture. Stripe is, maybe that's the best answer. I mean, you look, they kind of created their culture out of the best of several other companies. Um, I don't know. I think there's a lot of, you know, there's some very good cultures out there and there's some, uh, you know, culture is very personal. So for example, there are some people I tell uh, you will hate working at Amazon. I tell them either you'll quit in the first year or they'll fire you in the first year <laughs> because of their culture. Other people, I say you were born to work at Amazon. You will absolutely love it there. And most of the time I'm right. Just because I understand Amazon's culture and I understand, you know, if I know the person, but it's so personal, right? Because certain people, if I send to Amazon, I know they're going to hate it. Amazon acts more like a startup than 90% of the startups I know. <laughs> and, and a lot of people do not want that. Other people, that's exactly what they want. So it's a tough question because it's so personal. Totally. Um, Good. What is the best product you've used recently? Oh, jeez. Uh, I mean, I work. With, I I get to try a lot of products, but of course, I try them for a lot of s startups, and a lot of them have a lot of work to do. What would be a great example of a great product? I mean, there's. I. Uh, I love motorcycles. I ride motorcycles. I own a couple. And the state of the art in motorcycle technology today has never been better. And the just the, the full product of what they deliver is pretty outrageously good. Um, I will tell you, uh, uh, I don't know why, I've, uh, you just got me thinking about motor automotive. I don't want to buy a Tesla because of Elon Musk. So I bought a Rivian, which is um, which is a very very good product. They have done a, a very impressive job. Um, there's a lot of overlap with a Tesla. The difference is the head of Rivian is really a designer, a product designer, and you can tell that in the product. It is a beautifully designed product uh, that works holistically remarkably well. Amazing. We're way over time, but last question, I guess. What is your least favorite? This is the spicy topic, so we left it for last. Your least favorite product concept that has popped up? Oh my gosh! You know, this is this is a sensitive one because there's so many that really uh, make me frustrated. I think, though, the thing that bothers me more than anything else is this. You know, the, the prevalent definition of product management. Because I think not only is it not helpful, but I think it's the root reason so many people in that job are not happy. So that really does bother me. And I think what push, you know, I wrote this article recently that was very controversial called Product Management Theater. And what you know, I, we've seen these issues forever. It's not like they were new. But what pushed me over the edge was there was this article that made the rounds online by one of the major product certification programs that sort of certify product managers. And they described their job of the product manager. They had this big graphic and they said, this is the job of the product manager. And I'm looking at it and saying, I can't believe they think this. I can't believe they say this. 
I can't believe people believe them. It's terrible. Because all it did was describe a project manager, pure project management. And I'm like, all right, this is, and this is the major group certifying product managers. Okay, this is a problem. So that probably drives me nuts more than anything. 100%. It's kind of an epidemic yeah. right now of unhappy product managers as a result of misunderstanding their job. I guess that would be it. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, where can people can find you? I don't, when can we expect the new book? Well, yes. Um, well, I hope this was interesting to people. Yeah. Um, you can find more of my stuff at SVPG, Silicon Valley Product Group dot com. The new book is scheduled to come out on March 12th. However, I was told that in certain countries in Europe, Amazon is already shipping them several weeks ahead of schedule. So um, to check. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't know when mm. it's really, hopefully no later than March 12th. Um, and uh, it'll be out in, um, in Kindle, Audible, and hard copy. And the translations are underway already. Amazing. Amazing. Well, thank, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, an honor and a pleasure. Well, thanks for inviting me. And uh, uh, yeah, I appreciate the uh, dialogue. And I hope encourage you both to keep doing what you're doing.